Okay. Bismillah walhamdulillah salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ba'd uh, welcome to the fourth webinar titled aptitude and motivation in second language acquisition uh, that was organized by the faculty of languages and translation with the help of the deanship of e-learning and it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, and welcome professor Ordez Ortega this will be, in this webinar, uh, Professor Ortega will discuss the world of research on aptitude and motivation that has become available in the field of second language acquisition and which can help teachers answer some important questions. For example, are there special cognitive abilities or aptitude and certain personal predispositions, uh, motivation that could help and explain the large differences we all see in how successful students are in learning a new language in our classrooms. And how much does the surrounding environment contribute to the shaping aptitude and motivation in the classrooms, uh, for example, classrooms, family, and peers, society messages about the new language and its values and it is difficulty. And to what extent can aptitude and motivation to learn a new language change with experiences inside and outside the classroom. She also will point at ways in which this research can help language teachers strategize so they can support their students' aptitude and motivation and enhance their odds of lasting success with English in, langu in, in the language classrooms and beyond. Before we uh, start our presentation, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ortega. She is a professor in the Department of Linguistics at, uh, at Georgetown University in USA, where she monitors teachers and researchers and investigates key questions about second language acquisition and foreign language education. She is originally from Spain and taught her native Spanish in Greece for nearly a decade. And since 1993, uh, she uh, also uh, non-native English in diverse geographical in the United States. Her main research interests are in understanding linguistics and social educational influence that impact on language learning success of young people and adults and on their cognitive, social and educational well-being. She is also interested in, the, in child bilingualism, second language writing, and meta-analysis. In the last few years, she has been applying knowledge from bilingualism and from usage based in linguistics to uh, the investigation of second language development. Two central questions in this new agenda are, how does experience shape language learning? What counts as success in bi or multilingual acquisition? And who is to tell? Lourdes was a recipient of the Gumsler and Tesor Research Award in 2001 and has been a doctoral fellow or doctoral Mellon fellow in 1993 and 1999 and a postdoctoral Spencer or National Academy of Education fellow 2003 and a senior research fellow at Freiburg Institute of Advanced Studies in 2010. From 2010 to 2015, she was uh, the journal editor of language learning. Her publications include articles in flagship journals, such as Annual Review of Applied Linguistics, Applied Linguistics Journals, Foreign Language Annals Journals, Journal of Second Language Writing, Language Learning Journal, Language Learning and Technology Journal, Modern Language Journal and Study of Second Language Acquisition Journal, System Journal, and TESOL Quarterly Journal. She serves or has served on the editorial boards on a number of these and other journals. Her books include Technology Mediated Task Based Language Teaching, Researching Technology and Task published by John Ben Jemins in 2014. 
Another book is the usage of the usage based study of language learning and multilingualism, uh, published by Georgetown University Press in 2016. Uh, and another book is Understanding Second Language Acquisition, published in 2009. Lord Days is frequently invited to speak at international conferences, and she has been a plenary speaker at the American Association of Applied Linguistics Conference, the World Cong Congress of Applied Linguistics Conference, and the International TESOL Convention. This year, in April, she will be a plenary speaker at ITFL in Brighton, UK. She will spend her sabbatical this fall of 2018 in New York City uh, as a distinguished visiting fellow at the Advanced uh, Research Collaborative of, uh, city of uh, the City New York, uh, University of New York Graduate Center. And the list gone, and the CV is stolen. So I tried to summarize it in these uh, few lines. It's also uh, again it's my pleasure to welcome you all and welcome the participants. We have already uh, around 130 participants from different places in Saudi Arabia, and I welcome you all. And uh, I will hand the mic to uh, Professor Ortega to uh, present. Uh, the mic is yours, Professor Ortega. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Al Hamami. Um, I'm very grateful to have been invited to give this webinar, and I'm delighted to have um, 131 participants, it looks like now. Can everyone hear me? Is my voice clear? I hope so. I trust, uh, Dr. Al Hamami, that you will warn me if at any yes, point. Uh, we time, yes, so. Great. That we can hear you loud and clear. Great. So um, today I want to talk about learning aptitude and learning motivation when studying a new language. And I thought we could start with aptitude because it's a little bit less um, immediately uh, palatable or applicable to the classroom in the view of many teachers. Uh, then we'll take a break and then we'll do motivation, which usually appeals a lot more to many more teachers. And then I will also leave time for questions and answers at the end. So let's start with learning aptitude. Teachers often feel powerless towards natural gift or the inability for language learning. They think some, some of their students have a natural gift, some have some kind of a natural inability for learning language. And of course, what can they do about it? Not much if it's all genetic. So there are many intuitive notions that uh, teachers um, have and which make them feel powerless when they think of motivation of, of aptitude in the classroom. For example, many teachers and many people in general think that aptitude is genetic, that we're born with it, that it has to do with intelligence, good memory, or a musical ear, and that it's fixed. And oftentimes I hear uh, many of my colleagues in the field of second language acquisition and many language teachers Talk, it's high aptitude, low aptitude. Either a person has aptitude or doesn't have it. Either one has the gift or doesn't, doesn't have the gift to learn a foreign language well and fast. So if that's really what the research tells us, then there is little teachers can do about it. Here are some research insights. It is indeed true that there is a natural talent for foreign language learning. And the studies have showed that aptitude differences are quite good at predicting how easily and how fast um, students will learn a foreign language in the classroom. It is also true that foreign language aptitude is partially related to being very talented in one's own mother tongue or mother tongues. 
But also, the newest research in aptitude in SLA tells us that aptitude is multidimensional. We have three great aptitude tests in the field, meaning that they are very good at predicting how well, how fast a student will do when they start a, a new language. We have the MLAT, Modern Language Aptitude Test, and an offspring of it, the LAMA test. And the third test is called the HILAB test. So the MLAT was developed in the 80s by a psychologist called John Carroll. And it's used in, by the Defense Language Institute in the United States and by many other institutions to sort of predict how good people are at learning a new language in the classroom and then advise students, for example, in the military, whether they should study an easy language like Spanish or whether they should go for a difficult language like, say, Arabic, depending on how good they are in principle with their learn learning uh, aptitude. The LAMA is a test that was created to be used freely online by Paul Miara, who's a researcher in uh, the UK. And it's very similar to the MLAT, but it's totally free. You don't have to pay to take it or to give it to your students. It's online, it's faster to take, and so it's very popular in, in research studies today. The high, um, one thing that these two tests share is that they simulate language learning. So they ask students um, to engage in different tasks that simulate the real things that we do when we start learning a language. For example, trying to memorize new words that we don't know at all. The HILAB is a test that was developed very recently uh, by a group of researchers um, in the United States, and it was funded by money from the Defense Department. So similar to what happened in the 80s with the MLAT. You can see that uh, the defense, uh, governments and defense uh, ministries are very interested in knowing how fast, how, how much they can uh, ask their military personnel to, um, to study a language, how, how much can they ask them to put effort into language learning for their profession. And they believe that if they know what's their natural aptitude to do it, then things can be done more efficiently. One thing that is very special about the, this test is that, yes, it has some tasks that simulate language learning in the real world, like trying to memorize new words, but it also includes tasks that are non-verbal. They just don't have any linguistic material in them. Instead, they may have sounds or images. And so they test uh, cognitive abilities that seem to be very deep in the brain uh, related to language, but not directly involving language. So what we know um, from the two traditional tests, the MLAT and the LAMA, is that memory for vocabulary is a very big component of aptitude. Memory for phonetic details, for sounds, is also very important. And analytical ability or analytical learning is very important. What do we mean by analytical learning? We mean the ability to induce grammar rules when we don't know the rules, we're not explained the rules, but we're asked to look at language samples and try to figure out, try, try to guess um, um, what the rules behind the language samples are. So what we see is that the components of aptitude that are measured in those two tests are basically how well someone will be able to learn new, new words in a new language, how good someone will be with new sounds and the corresponding the correspondence between sounds and how they are written and writing system and how good someone will be when they try really really hard very explicitly to discover hidden patterns in a language that they're hearing or reading without being explained any rules the other test the high lab test measures some things that are similar 
to the other two traditional tests, the memory for vocabulary and the memory for sounds and letters. But instead of measuring analytical ability, it measures implicit learning. This is the ability to pick up the, the, the grammar rules of a language or a system, but without even trying to guess what they are. So the way these tests does it is um, the participants or the examinees or the students are exposed to images and crosses and boxes that move on the screen and they don't know that there is a system for how they move and when a cross or a, or a box appears or disappears. But over a few minutes of being exposed to it, the brain actually starts predicting what's coming next based on the rules. Um, so people who are very good at implicitly learning statistical patterns and rules behind the language will be able to start predicting um, without even knowing, but they start to respond faster to the boxes and the crosses uh, on the screen, and they start predicting when they're going to appear, in which part of the, of the screen they're going to appear, and in what sequence. So here what we have is a test that measure the ability to learn new, lang new words in a new language easily, the ability to remember and learn letter sequences and sequences of sounds easily, and the ability to abstract statistical hidden patterns when no rules are explained and when actually we're not even told that there are any rules that we should be trying to guess. So then combined, the three tests tell us that aptitude is composed of at least four things. Good memory for words, so people who learn vocabulary easily in a new language, they have aptitude that excels in that area. Good memory for sounds and letters and sequences of letters and sounds. Typically, these people are the people we see, the students we see who have very good pronunciation. Uh, the ability to guess and induce grammar rules when we know there are rules, but we don't know what the rules are, and we try really hard to guess them. And the ability to learn um, grammar patterns, regularities and rules from language, but we don't even know that we're trying to learn something. Okay, so this is why we talk in SLA about aptitude as a multidimensional phenomenon and aptitude complexes. And the two researchers who have done the most work are Peter Robinson, who lives in Japan, and Peter Skian, who lives in Hong Kong. For some reason, my... Oh. Okay. Oh, let me see. Okay, here it is. So the aptitude complexes that we have in the classroom we can guess probably that we will have students who have good memory for words, for sounds, or both, and good analytical abilities, whether to guess rules when they try really hard to guess what's going on with language, or just because they pick up rules and patterns and regularities even without knowing that they're picking them up easily. So these are the best uh, students that we have in class with the best ability, right? They have very high aptitude both in the areas of memory and in the areas of analysis. We may have very sad students who have very low ability in memory and in analysis areas. These are the ones that struggle in class and we wonder if they don't have this natural ability to learn languages. But then we have also mixed ability um, students in our class. We can have people who have very high memory but not so great analysis abilities, or we may have people who are really good at analyzing language implicitly or explicitly, but their memory abilities are not so great. I wonder if those who are listening to me right now can think of, can you think of a student in your class that you would classify in one of these four profiles? excellent in all kinds of aptitude for language, 
quite poor and struggling, seems like having no aptitude in any area, and people who excel in memory but fall behind with analysis, and the other way around, people who struggle with memorizing words, understanding new sounds and how they are put together in a new language, and yet they have a very good ability to understand rules and to guess rules and to learn rules. I have had mostly, in my experience, a lot of students who are excellent in language aptitude, um, many students who have mixed profiles one way or the other, and very, very few students who seem to have just no strength, no natural talent in any area of language. Um, so I am going to illustrate uh, what I mean by these different profiles with some data from a third year Spanish class that I taught in the United States many years ago in the late 90s. And these students were enrolled in, in a grammar and composition course. Um, and I had asked them to tell me um, what kinds of strengths and weaknesses they had with their Spanish and what they were trying to do to improve their Spanish in my course. And here's what different people wrote. Joanna, for example, said, I tried to analyze each new word by dividing it into syllables or known parts in order to find a meaning. I always look for similarities and differences between Spanish and English, and also for the structure in phrases. So when I read this, I thought, wow, Joanna has a real high aptitude in, what do you think? In memory, in analysis, or in both? I thought, she's really good with analysis and she knows it. She's aware of, of that strength. Brad, on the other hand, said to me in his journal, I can easily remember the vocabulary and retain it, but with grammar and when to use certain verbs, I have a really, really difficult time remembering in Spanish when to use la que and if I need to use a or less when I write. So he was describing both a very high facility with something and quite a bit of a difficulty with something else. And yes, he has high memory abilities, but low abilities with analyzing language and learning rules. So if language aptitude is a multidimensional phenomenon, not a binary or a categorical thing, it's not just about high or low aptitude, we have it or we don't have it, then teachers can do a lot more in their classroom about aptitude. So what can we do about aptitude in our classroom? Obviously, we have to plan activities, uh, lessons, so that we can play up uh, the aptitudinal strengths and profiles of our students. So I will give examples for how we could do the, these for each of the four profiles. What is for profile one, high memory ability but low capacity for language analysis, what can a, te a teacher do? Can you think about it a little bit? Do you do something for your students who have great memory strengths but who struggle with analyzing grammar and analyzing and understanding language? One thing we can do is make sure to include diverse activities and tasks in our teaching that take advantage of excellent memory. For example, internet uh, computer mediated communication types of activities or vocabulary games. Because these students are going to succeed greatly when we give them such activities and they're going to learn a lot, a lot of language and very fast. We can also make sure that when we give assignments and tasks, we include roles where these students can capitalize on good memory and on a holistic approach to language learning. Other students may not be able to do this, but if we change different roles in different assignments, for example, a student is in charge of reading something on the internet and spot all the new words and then looking them up in the dictionary 
and explaining them to the rest of the students. This is something that someone with great memory ability will be able to do well. Finally, because they have some weaknesses in their capacity to analyze language, we may want to fine tune our explicit grammar instruction for these students because they will need extra help being able to notice and to understand uh, the rules of English. They're not going to just do it very well, very easily on their own. They will need our own help with very good grammar explanations that are easy for them because otherwise on their own, they're not gonna be able to guess grammar rules or to feel grammar rules very easily. The exact reverse is true of a profile like a second profile where memory capacity is low but analysis is high. Here we need to play to the analytical skills and grammatical sensitivity that these students um, bring because that's their strength. So they need to feel successful and they need to feel like they shine for these uh, things that they do well. So we can have some grammar games, some inductive activities, guessing rules, see who in class can guess the rule, and even some translation activities, if that's something that our program does. These students with high analytical um, aptitude will be able to do really well and enjoy these kinds of activities. But at the same time, in this profile, these students are likely to struggle with long lists of vocabulary that they need to memorize, for example and they will constantly perhaps forget words, new words. So it may be useful to train them with some vocabulary learning strategies and some communication strategies too, so that they feel a little bit more supported in their memory for language. What do we do with those few students who seem to have no actual strength uh, in terms of aptitude? They just don't seem to have either good memory or good analytical abilities. Can we do something for them as teachers? Well, first, we must understand their goals in learning the language and we can help them evaluate whether those goals are realistic and whether they can learn the language as fast as they want, as well as they want. But we also need to be inspiring them to keep up the effort because they will need more time perhaps than other peers to get to the same place. And we will have to turn to motivation. When aptitude is low in every area, motivation needs to be even more important, even more nourished. Because if they really love English, if they really want to learn the language and achieve in the language, then they will persist and they will put the extra time that probably they need when compared to other students with better aptitude in general. And also, if your program allows it, it's very useful to be able to assess and to praise the students for their own personal effort, not just comparing them constantly to the rest of the group, because we know they're more vulnerable, they learn a little bit slowlier, in terms of language learning, they may make progress that is not ideal. And so they need our support in being praised when they do really well, um, because they have put a lot of extra effort. Finally, what do we do with the geniuses of language learning, the ones that have great memory abilities, great analytical abilities, and they would score really high in any of the three um, language aptitude tests that exist. Do they need anything from us teachers? What do you think? I always ask this from my students who are teachers and always inevitably someone has the right answer. We need to provide these students with sufficiently challenging instruction because otherwise they're going to get demotivated and uninterested. So they're so good in their aptitude, they have so many strengths all around, that they are able to learn language on their own really fast, really well. But if they learn so much on their own, they may get bored and demotivated and uninterested if we are not able to pay attention to them in class and give them some extra challenge. 
So remember that what we have then in the research are four kinds of abilities that make up aptitude. We have vocabulary. Um, in the area of vocabulary, we have good memory for words. So people who can learn new vocabulary fast, they hear it once or twice, they encounter it in the readings once or twice, and that's enough to remember a new word. We also have people who are very good in their memory for sounds and how sound, sounds and letters correspond. And so they are typically also very able to attain good pronunciation in a language. We have people who are very good at guessing grammar rules and linguistic patterns when they read, when they speak, when they try to do something on their own in the internet, when they watch movies with subtitles. But they do it because they try really hard to guess what the rule behind what they're seeing or hearing is. So they love grammar explanations from their teachers and they are stimulated by the challenge to crack the rules of language. They have this language analytical ability. But then there is also other students who have a tremendous ability in implicitly guessing grammar rules without even trying. So these are people who just by using language, they actually start picking up a lot of regularities and patterns in the grammar, the new grammar that they're learning. And they don't even know, they're not trying hard, but they're very good at it. Um, as I showed in my examples, it's actually quite easy to ask your students, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Where do you struggle? What do you do to try to learn uh, language better? And they will be able to tell you probably if they feel they're good or not with their vocabulary learning, if they feel they're good or not with sounds and with pronunciation and also if they feel comfortable or not understanding grammar rules, applying grammar rules, and guessing grammar rules. The fourth type of ability, whether people can pick up the patterns of a language without even trying just by using language, um, that's very difficult to know consciously or to report consciously. So it's very unlikely that you would be able to, to know that some of your students have that kind of an ability without having the high lab, the test that measures it. But I strongly recommend to discuss these things with students and to actually use questionnaires, uh, little uh, free write-ups, uh, journals in class to actually make them more aware of where they may have strengths in their aptitude and where they may have weaknesses, so that then you can also uh, make sure that you include a mixture of activities, roles in activities, and ways of uh, trying to appeal to the strengths of students so they feel successful in something that they are strong at, whether it's vocabulary learning or uh, applying grammar rules and guessing grammar rules and so that you can provide extra support when some individuals feel that they are struggling with learning new uh, vocabulary, for example, or with um, coping with grammar explanations and new grammar rules that they never remember to apply when they try. So the research tells us that Aptitude is not monolithic or dichotomous. It's not a matter of high and low, yes or no. It's not like we have the gift for language learning or we just don't have it. It's multidimensional. And so we can actually try to diagnose our students and address our students' needs in the area of aptitude by thinking of their memory for new words, their memory for sounds, their capacity for analyzing, guessing the rules of language, and very difficult to assess, but it is also their, their capacity to learn implicitly the statistics of the language, the patterns that every language uh, has. Let me see. Okay. 
So teachers can diversify pedagogy to cater to students with different combinations of strengths and weaknesses in their language learning aptitude. And this is what the research in second language acquisition suggests. I don't know if you want to take the break now. Um, Dr. Alhamami, is it too early for the break? Should I go on for a little while or should we take the break? I think we'll, we'll, we'll take the break. Okay, let's take the break and then when we, in 10 minutes please, and when we come back then we're going to look at motivation, which I trust will be of high interest um, to everyone who's a teacher. And it'll be a little bit more material, so that's why I prefer to take the break now and then have a little extra time for motivation. Okay, great. Thank you. Is anyone already back? We've taken a break for 15 minutes so far instead of 10. All of them is still here. We have a 157, they are here with us in the room. So I think all of them is in the room. Okay, so can we start? Yes, yeah, sure, definitely. Excellent. So welcome back. And after the break, what we are doing is talking now about L2 learning motivation. And this is an area that is very enjoyable for both teachers and researchers because teachers really know the importance of motivation in their teaching and they understand that they, they need to do things to motivate their students. Usually also good teachers are very capable of motivating their students and the researchers know it. So researchers who uh, investigate motivation in language learning work really well with teachers. I wanted to highlight two studies that I find very impressive and very hopeful in their findings. One was by Guillotto and Dorney in 2008. And for the first time, they actually investigated what kinds of motivational strategies teachers use in their teaching and whether they really have an impact on the motivation of their students. So this study was massive. It was done with 25 teachers, 1,300 high school EFL students in South Korea, and the teachers had no special training. They were just EFL teachers, but they had no special training in being motivating to their students. So the two researchers observed all these 27 teachers teaching their own high school students, and they found that they, they use these four types of motivational strategies. They used a lot of creativity and fantasy to connect with students' interest. They also personalized opportunities to express experiences, feelings, and opinions. So their students were encouraged in these highly motivating teachers to express opinions and feelings and experiences. The teachers also set tangible task products. So they would do a task or an activity that resulted in a poster or a brochure. And they were good teachers who gave feedback free from irritation or personal criticism. So they were able to correct errors. They were able to grade um, tasks and posters and exams without discouraging the students. And amazingly, the researchers collected also surveys from all these students and how motivated they were in these different classes. And over 1,000 students' responses showed that those teachers who used more of these motivational strategies also had students who were more motivated than the rest of students. And so the relationship between the, the teacher's use of motivational strategies and the student's degree of motivation to learn English was very strongly correlated. 
This is the first time that this has been shown empirically. Normally, we assume that when a teacher is good at motivating the students, the students will be more motivated. But that's just an assumption. In this study, they actually proved that what teachers do in the classroom really makes an impact on the students' level of motivation. The other study was conducted in Saudi Arabia, and uh, it comprised high school and college classes. It was done by Moskovsky, Al-Rabai, Paulini, and Racheva. And actually, I found out that Al-Rabai, Fakir Al-Rabai, is or was at least in 2013 at King Khalid University. So some of you may know him as a, as a colleague or as a teacher or as a former teacher. So in this study, they, uh, what they did is they uh, worked with 14 teachers, almost 300 EFR learners, as I say, both in high school and college. And very cleverly, they pre-selected 10 motivational strategies that the research shows make a big difference when teachers do them on their students' motivation. And for eight weeks, they trained the teachers to use those uh, strategies with their students and they observed the teachers to see that they really were using those strategies with their students. They compared everything to a very tight control uh, groups of, of classrooms where the teachers were not getting any training to be particularly motivational or not. And in the end, they really produced compelling evidence that teachers make a clear difference in student motivation and that if we train teachers to use more motivational strategies to remember to use them often the students really go up in their motivation to learn English and let me show you the 10 motivational strategies that they used to train teachers in this study um, the colors are just to give you a little bit of eye <laughs> variety when you go through them. Um, but if you look through them, these 10 strategies, what I find is strict, extremely interesting is that only two are really about language teaching and language learning specifically. So strategy number six is to increase the amount of second, uh, second language, foreign language, English that you use in the classroom because students feel motivated by that. And number eight is to remind students of the importance of English as a global language and the usefulness of mastering the skills of this language. So the kinds of useful things they can do in life if they know English better. But besides its strategies six and eight, the other strategies were purely motivational strategies for good teaching. Things like breaking the routine of the classroom <clears throat> by varying the learning tasks and the presentation format, or uh, showing students that you care about their progress, or showing students that you accept and care about them, recognizing their effort and their achievement, be mentally and physically available to respond to your students' academic needs in the classroom. So being available during office hours or if you use email with your students or whatever other formats. Making learning tasks more, more attractive by adding humorous elements. So this is a difficult one. Uh, some teachers are able to be more humorous than others, but definitely adding a little bit of humor to your teaching can motivate students. Relay the subject content and learning tasks to the everyday experiences and backgrounds of the students. So connecting the topics in the textbook, the types of activities that you do with actual things that students experience in their own lives and that they know and care. And finally, consistently encourage students by drawing their attention to the fact that you believe in their effort to learn and in their capabilities to succeed. So these are interesting strategies. They come from a wealth of research showing when teachers inspire the students and motivate their students. And most of them are about good teaching, good teacher-student relations. And only two of them are about language-specific things that motivate students. But what's important in this study is that actually remember and using actively 
um, more of these strategies resulted in a higher level of motivation among the students. However, the research also shows that students are motivated by surprisingly, surprisingly different things. So even in the same uh, classroom, even in the same program, in the same country, uh, teaching students English who are of a similar age, of a similar educational background, family background, we think we know more or less what motivates them all as a group, right? But the research shows that actually very different students can, can feel personally uh, motivated by quite, quite different things. And so here is where the research on motivation, I think, can help teachers make better sense of these differences in motivation. So as I said, teachers are very, very good at motivating their students and they really know how important motivation is. But sometimes teachers are not so good at seeing that very different uh, people in their classrooms, despite sharing background, family education, general goals, general goals for English, that they may be motivated by quite, quite different things in the end. So going back to my illustrations from my study that I did in the late 90s with my own classroom of Spanish uh, students at a university in the United States. Um, in this case, they were um, writing in their journal every other week and I asked them to tell me about the accomplishments in the semester. So this was um, at the middle of the semester. I asked them to write and tell me where they felt they had accomplished things and also what goals they had for learning Spanish until the end of the semester. And here are some of the things that my students told me. Helen said, I need to learn a lot to be better at communicating well with Spanish speaking people. My dream is to attain a mastery of Spanish similar to that of a Spanish speaking person. So if you change Spanish for English, have you had students who said this, that their dream was to attain a mastery of English similar to that of an English speaking person? Helen, what, is, what, what she's showing is a level of motivation and a kind of motivation that is known in the SLA uh, research as integrative motivation. So the desire to become a member of the new community of speakers and desire to be close and to be accepted for a speaker of that language. But Mike, this is what Mike told me in that journal entry when I asked him about his progress and his goals for the rest of the semester. He said, I've been lazy and this has damaged my grades in this class. Whereas I had good grades at the beginning of this class. I want to repair my grades and the concrete things I can do to help myself in this case is to do my homework with more passion and interest so I can learn. When I read this, I was so surprised because it was true that Mike had been going down in his grades and we know from the research that some students have an instrumental motivation. They're moved by their grades, by getting a better job, by having some kind of reward, either in the school or in society. But the second part in Mike's comments caught also my attention because he just didn't say, I just want good grades and so I'm going to try to get good grades again in my language uh, class, right? He also said he could do better grades by doing the homework with more passion and interest and by actually learning more. So normally when we think of instrumental motivation, sometimes both researchers and teachers think that this is some kind of a not so good motivation. It's more like just for a reward, a, a, a monetary reward, a prestige reward, a societal reward, a great reward. And yet this showed me that in fact, students motivated by say uh, the need to get a better grade, they still may appreciate the passion, the effort, the interest and the actual learning that they are trying to achieve. Now, 
when I talk to teachers, when I talk to my own students who are teachers, oftentimes they have heard about um, integrative and instrumental motivation, and they know about this research that shows that some people are motivated by the desire to integrate into the new group of speakers, the new society, and that others are more motivated by instrumental reasons, like getting better grades. But is this just all we need to know about motivation? Is motivation just about this dichotomy? Listen to what Liz told me in her journal entry. She says, I like this Spanish grammar and composition class very much because I like writing. I had given them a lot of writing assignments, journal writing, academic writing, so they were writing a lot throughout the semester. And this was at the midpoint of the semester. So she says, I like this class very much because I like writing. People think that I am odd, but it is true. I don't like writing while writing, but when I'm done, I like it. And this was, she was writing in Spanish and she wasn't that good writing, at, uh, you know, using Spanish to write. This is what we call intrinsic motivation. It's being motivated just by the sheer pleasure of studying the language, doing the language. In this case, by the sheer pleasure of writing in Spanish or English or a language that is not your own language. So Liz was just uh, happy when she wrote and it was hard work. So while writing, she didn't like writing that much because it was work. But once, once she was done, she just loved it because she had this kind of a flow or a high for writing in a second language, in a foreign language. Phil, on the other hand, says, I know Spanish students don't like the preterite and the imperfect, but it is important to practice them in order to improve. I think it is really bad that I still cannot distinguish well between the preterite and the imperfect after having studied them for almost two semesters. They are very difficult and therefore I want to master them. The preterite and the imperfect are two tenses that are very difficult to master and that all textbooks and all teachers of Spanish and drill and teach to their students again and again and again every semester, all throughout the intermediate levels and the advanced levels. So what kind of motivation did Phil have here? Was it integrative to become like another a member of the Spanish speaking community? Not really. Was it instrumental to get a better grade? Also not. Was it intrinsic for the pleasure and the sheer high of learning the language or mastering the imperfect or the preterite? Probably also not. I think what was going on with Phil is that he's repeating the messages that he has heard from his teachers through many, many different semesters of Spanish. The teachers are the ones who tell the students that it is a shame not to be able to distinguish between these two tenses after studying them for so long, and that it really just is an obligation of students who, who are good language uh, learners to learn these things about this language. So what Phil is showing here is what we call identified motivation. It's a very interesting kind of motivation. It's sort of like making the goals, the aspirations of parents or teachers or even peers, things that other people tell you you should be doing because it's good, because it's a shame not to, making those goals your own, internalizing them to the point that you believe them, you buy into them as a motivating thing, as a value. So that's what Phil was doing. Um, Beyond the types of motivation that I have shown you, and these were four students, all of them in the same class, all of them coming from the same kind of context in the United States for the, the learning of Spanish. There are many uh, theories of motivation um, and many, many studies of motivation. And so I want to show you a little bit of the four main theories of motivation that we have in the field. The traditional theory of motivation is this dichotomy between integrative and instrumental motivation. This was developed in Canada by a researcher called um, Gardner, Bob Gardner. 
And it really was very famous as a theory of motivation all during the 60s and all the way until the 90s. And so the theory went uh, by saying that when someone feels integrated motivation, the desire to become like a native speaker, like a member of the community of speakers of that language, that's the best kind of motivation. That's the motivation that is going to carry a student forward all the way to best attainment in the language. This, of course, works better in a country like Canada, where French and English are official languages. And so Anglophones learn French and Francophones learn English. And a big part of being motivated to learn the other people's language well is to feel sympathy and empathy for the other group of people in the country and the desire to sort of like become friends and, and become integrated into the other community. But it doesn't work so well in many other contexts, right? Like in Saudi Arabia, I cannot imagine that many students just want to become members of, I don't know, the UK or the US or Australia or Canada or New Zealand um, as speakers of English. They don't have any reasons for that, yeah? They don't encounter perhaps even very many native speakers in their own contexts anyway, right? So, Another theory of motivation that was proposed for other contexts and um, as an alternative to some extent to the traditional theory of motivation is called self-determination. Self-determination proposed by Kim Noels, also in North America, actually she was also in Canada. It proposes that there is a continuum of different qualities of motivation, all the way from intrinsic which is like the best kind of motivation to extrinsic or a motivation. So this continuum works in terms of how much we think we are able to choose our own goals, to choose our own um, project for learning English. Do we do it because we want to, or do we feel like we're doing it because of the pressures around us? So when we feel we're doing it because it really gives us pleasure and enjoyment, then we have intrinsic motivation. And it's possible for someone to be surrounded by all kinds of pressures to learn English, and yet to also feel this irrational love for English that is based just on feeling pleasure while trying to learn and to use English. But other people will have an identified or an introjected or an extrinsic motivation, meaning that their goals for learning will come from the, from the outside. They will come from parents, teachers, society, pressure from peers. It will be not chosen, chosen by them, but it will be more like imposed by others. The ideal self is perhaps the most popular and most current theory of motivation that we have right now. It started in the mid late uh, 90s with uh, Zoltan Donier, who is from Hungary in Europe. And he was the first to criticize the traditional Canadian view of motivation. Uh, he said, you know, in a country like Hungary and in many countries where English is used as an international language, it makes no sense to think that students are motivated by the desire to become one member of the English speaking community. What makes sense is to think that um, they have a mental image of themselves as an English speaker, and they can imagine also some value, some benefits that they can um, obtain from being speakers of English. And this image of the self is what keeps them going with the learning of English and the efforts to learn English. So uh, very interesting in this kind of theory of motivation is that they study uh, the images, the mental images that students can explain when they imagine themselves being the kind of person who can speak English in the future. The more vivid the images are, the more likely the motivation is strong and it will sustain the students through lots of time and lots of effort um, in learning English. And so 
when we know, for example, that our English is not so great, but we have this strong image in our head that we will become this kind of person who speaks English fluently, then we make all kinds of efforts and we take all kinds of specific actions to make that happen, to narrow the gap between our actual self in actual life right now and our ideal self in the images that we get for our future. So this is a very powerful theory of motivation. Uh, it's very psychological, as you can see. It, it's all in the head and the imagination of uh, students. Um, but, but it has been applied in many, many contexts, uh, especially in foreign language contexts for English. So English as an international language, which is, of course, the context, I think, that Saudi Arabia represents. Finally, the theory of investment was proposed by Bonnie Norton, also in Canada. And she was studying immigrants, immigrant women in Canada, and how much they put effort or not into learning English, which was the language of the surrounding community. And she concluded that really, these women were investing or not investing time, money, effort, and their own personal uh, personal time, their own personal imagination, depending on whether they saw real material or symbolic uh, improvements in learning English or not. So for example, one of the women said she wanted to learn English and speak it well, but eventually stopped going to ESL classes because she found out that she was good at computers. And she, she just saw that she could get a really good job uh, with computers if she invested time in studying computers. And she didn't need English for that necessarily. So instead of uh, investing time first in English and eventually in computers, she decided to invest all her time into computers because she really saw a, a symbolic and a material opportunity for improvement in her life through the idea of computers and not English. Another woman uh, had children and so she had to really negotiate the rent with the landlord and she had to fend for her children in the new society. And so in the beginning, she was very shy. She was very insecure in her use of English. But once she saw that she needed to do it because of her role as a mother of a family, she completely started speaking and improving in English and making every effort to speak English just for the sake of having a good, uh, powerful influence on her children's lives. So as you see, each theory of motivation is slightly different. It originates in different kinds of contexts, and it helps ex explain different ways in which we humans um, decide to fight for goals that we take upon ourselves. And the goal of learning English can be because we want to become a member of an English speaking community or because we just feel great pleasure when we are engaged with English studies or because we have a strong image of ourselves as a, as a, a speaker of English in our future life or because we have concrete things in our lives that uh, we will achieve if we are able to speak English better. So, but there are many other things that happen with motivation and I wanted to touch on some of them. I think I will do about five minutes and then we can open it up for questions and answers on both aptitude and motivation. Is that right? Yes, okay, we can do that. Okay, great. So. A little bit about identity, agency, and affect, because if you look at the research, these three concepts are very important when talking about motivation. So for identity, for example, here's an example from a student, um, a former uh, teacher of ESL who wrote a journal for me. She says, once I had a student who kept saying, I came from Korea. So when asked, where are you from? This this student, this ESL student kept saying, I came from Korea. 
So my teacher said, I tried to correct her grammar by saying, if you are originally from Korea, you should use present tense when you refer to it. So if you're asked, where, where are you from? You should say, I come from Korea, not I came from Korea. That's all really good, right? That's typical grammar error correction. But then my student kept saying in, his, in her journal to me, my student said, since I don't want to go back to Korea and I identify myself with American, I'd rather say I came from Korea and wish to be an American one day. So my student, who was a teacher and was a teacher of this student, she was horrified. She didn't know what to respond back because in the end, it didn't seem like a, a problem with grammar. It seemed like a problem with this person's identity, which, which was shifting from being just Korean to wanting to be also American, right? So someone may choose to say certain things and make a grammatical mistake because of identity reasons, right? Obviously, this has a very easy solution. My teacher could have told her student, oh, that's what you want people to understand when you say, I came from Korea. Well, if you want them to understand that, all you need to do is say, I originally come from Korea. And just that little word, originally, helps them understand that that's not all you are, just Korean, but that you have, you know, you have moved on towards an identity as an American as well. With agency, sometimes students feel very powerless because they feel like they cannot make progress. There is no point in, in making the effort. They're just not good at it. And so agency, a sense of agency is important for sustaining motivation. So here's an example from Eva, who was born in China, moved to Australia when she was 16, and then to the US when she was 19. And she says to the researcher, I have never started anything from A, B, C, D. Everything is always skip, skip, skip. Since I've been going so many places, first China, then Australia, then the US, I wasn't taught the way a person is supposed to be taught. I wasn't taught in the right way. So that is why some of the grammars were never drilled into me. So this person is convinced that she has never been taught the right way. Now it's too late and she cannot have good English. She has a very low sense of agency and that is going to affect her motivation, of course. Finally, affect. Someone, a Thai graduate student who was over 30 years old and she was doing a degree in business in New Zealand. She told the researcher in this study, at the first time, I think that my writing is good because friends always say that it's good. But my teachers say that I have to have a lot of writing because it's not so good. And at the first time, I feel confident of my writing because I think that my grammar my tense and my plural and verb use with plural with singular is okay. But when the feedback come out, the teacher doesn't look enough in that grammar. The grammar is not the most important thing for her. So she check in the coherence and in introduction in something else. And I haven't got good marks. So I think that I am poor in everything of writing. I think that my grammar is good but I didn't get any comments that, oh, your grammar is good, but you still have to, you still have to correct about something like this. All the comments come that my writing is not so good. So I feel that everything is poor. I think that at least she should admire me some points. From that time, I discouraged a lot and I feel don't like writing. So this is obviously a case of affect. So in order for students to keep motivated, they need to be praised. They need to feel that we are giving them some positive feedback as well as negative feedback and fair grades. And so if we cannot admire them some points in the things that they do with their English, it is very difficult for them to stay motivated with their English learning. So the research shows us that different students will be moved by very specific different qualities of motivation. 
and that we really need to look for that in each student in our class. This is very relevant for teaching because we must be alert towards identifying what motivates different students so that we can cater for variety in their motivational practices. In sum, what we have learned today, I hope, is that when it comes to learning aptitude, you can do something about it as a teacher. You can play to the students' different strengths. And you can remember who may be good at memory, who may be good at analytical ability, and who may be good at everything or at nothing, so that we can vary our approach to each student in that respect and support them with their weaknesses and help them uh, feel success by using their strengths. And with respect to motivation, motivation is very important. Teachers understand it very well, but motivation is complex and there is more than meets the eye. So we need to look beneath the surface and we need to address different kinds of motivations for different kinds of students in our same classes. And we have to look at them and we have to we have to try to guess whether they are motivated by integrative, instrumental, intrinsic motivation, by the ideal self, investment, or something else. We shouldn't just use one or two uh, types of uh, pitches and strategies to motivate our students because different students will have different sources for motivation. And if we only use one, we won't be able to motivate all of them. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think we do have time now for um, questions uh, and comments on both topics. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ortega, for this uh, interesting and informative presentation. And uh, before we start uh, uh, our Q&A session, uh, that was uh, Dr. Abdullah Minhi, the Dean of the College of Languages and Translation, asked me to send his apology for not being able to attend this webinar because he has a uh, family issues and personal issues. So he could not uh, join us. And he asked me to send uh, his apology to the presenter, Professor Ortega, and also to the entity. Uh, and also, I, uh, on behalf of my colleagues at the Faculty of Languages and Translation, I thank also the Deanship of E-Learning for facilitating this webinar and help us with the, uh, the technology. Uh, also, I should thank the participants who we have uh, at some point, we have 165 uh, participants during this presentation. Uh, regarding the Q&A, uh, you can send your questions. There is an icon uh, that says Q&A. So send your questions uh, there, and I will try to present them one by one. So uh, for uh, the first question, I will present it is from uh, Dr. Uh, Dawood Mahdi. The question is, is language aptitude test different from general aptitude test? Yes, it is. So general aptitude could be academic, could be related to intelligence, but language aptitude is specific to how fast and how well students will take classes and learn a language in a classroom context. So it's very specific and we have those three tests that can measure it quite well quite, uh, you know, make good predictions. And so it's used, as I said, by the Defense Department here in the United States to tell soldiers who, are, who volunteer to learn languages to use them in their work. Uh, they take the aptitude test and then they're told, okay, you better learn Spanish because in training in the next 10 months, you can get really good at Spanish but your aptitude is not so good if you try to learn Arabic or Korean, which are very, very difficult languages. And when they find a, a military person who is very good in their aptitude for language, they, they score really high on those tests, then they ask them to, to learn Arabic because in those 10 months, they're gonna achieve a lot better Arabic than most of the other people around them. Interesting. Uh, the next question also from Dr. Dawood Mahdi. Uh, what is the difference between aptitude and intelligence? Yes, um, a, lot, <clears throat> a lot of uh, intelligence tests measure ver verbal intelligence and other tests uh, measure nonverbal intelligence. And so 
when it's about verbal intelligence, it will partially overlap with language aptitude. So people who have high verbal intelligence in their first language, in their, in their languages that they grow, grew up with, they tend to have high uh, language aptitude. However, the overlap is not absolute. It's only a partial overlap. And so it's sufficient, the two are sufficiently different that we can measure both independently and measuring both independently is, is a good uh, research practice because you can't just predict how well someone will do with language learning by measuring their verbal intelligence. And you cannot predict how verbally intelligent someone will be just by giving them a language aptitude test. Interesting. Uh, the next question, uh, by the way, you can, uh, if you have a question, send it to the Q&A icon, not on the chat, because I will, I will, I will try to present a question from the Q&A icon. Mm -hmm. The next question from uh, anonymous attendee, he said, uh, could you please elaborate on challenging instruction? for excellent student in memory and analysis. Uh, how should that be managed keeping in mind different abilities in one class? It might create some feeling of discrimination among the weak, the weak, uh, the weak student. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's true that we have to be very, very careful not to, not to show that we know two or three people in the class are amazing in their language learning aptitude and that two or three people in the class are very weak in all ways, right? We have to be very fair to all students. But the proposal is to create opportunities for differentiated instruction or for individualized instruction. So if we have some students who seem to be really, really good at learning English fast and well, we may give them, for example, some extra homework that is more challenging or we may make them responsible to, I don't know, to watch a movie and then present it to the class. We wouldn't want the very weak person um, to, to ask them to do that, but we could ask the very strong person to do it. And then we could ask other people to take notes during the presentation and write up a report out of that, right? So, that's really, I mean, it, it depends on each classroom, each curriculum, each program. But what teachers, the lesson to take out of this is that we can try to differentiate instruction and activities as much as we can. And so, for example, a very strong student who is very, very capable in terms of aptitude, we could have them watch a movie and come to class and present it orally to the rest of the class. And then we could have the rest of the class take notes and write a report uh, like reviewing the movie or something like that, which is less challenging and more supported. So, but I agree that it's very important to treat all students equally in terms of the respect and the appreciation that we show to all of them. Interesting. The next question also from another attendees, anonymous attendees. He said, uh, which type of motivation do you uh, think should be enhanced in Saudi EFL informant? Well, this is an interesting question. There is some research um, suggesting that in context for the use of English as an international language, many students who have a very high international posture are motivated to learn English. International posture is a, a concept in the theory of motivation that says uh, students who constantly read uh, international news, who are always thinking about not just their own country or their own school or their own family or their own uh, neighborhood, but they're also interested in uh, international things, right? International movies, international music, international political news those students seem to have a very keen um, sense of learning English because they connect it to that international world that they like. So I'm not sure because I have never taught in Saudi Arabia, so I don't know how feasible or how real this would be. But uh, the suggestion would be to understand if there are some dynamics in the country that make learning English more useful, more favorable, um, more intrinsically um, pleasurable. 
and then to try to tell our students, remind our students of the value of learning English in Saudi Arabia. Okay. The next question is from uh, our colleague Hassan Jashan. Uh, he asked, how can we use the long-term memory and short-term memory to activate the aptitude and motivation of students to learn English? Wow. <laughs> Um, the the long-term memory has to do with learning vocabulary, learning new vocabulary well. So when someone has a good capacity in long-term memory, that means that they can learn vocabulary much faster than other people. In that case, we should encourage them to keep learning new vocabulary, to keep reading, for example, and when they read, to search for new words and try to learn new words. Um, when other people don't have such long-term memory capacity, it means that they're going to read the same, the same text, but they're not going to remember the new words very well, right? In those cases, we can teach them um, lear um, uh, uh, vocabulary learning strategies that try to help them um, memorize the, the words better. So mnemotechnic types of uh, strategies or keeping a notebook with new vocabulary or just telling them that repeating a word in writing and in speaking can help remembering the word. The short-term memory is related much more with the learning of grammar and the picking up of the patterns of language. And so short-term memory capacity seems to be related with the two analytical abilities that I mentioned. The one where if we try really hard, we can guess what this piece of language, this new rule is doing in the English language. And if we have very good implicit memory, memory ability in, in short-term memory, then we, we are just using English or watching a video or a movie or listening to songs and we're actually picking up a lot of patterns of language and we don't even know it because we have such a good ability right so the long-term memory has to do with memory for words the short-term memory has much more to do with learning grammar well either um, explicitly or implicitly and I don't think that either one is related to motivation motivation has to do more with the reasons for learning a language, the feelings that we have of confidence, of pleasure, of belonging to a different group, of international uh, things that we like, those kinds of things have to do with motivation. Um, so memory, long-term or short-term, probably doesn't have to do with motivation a whole lot. Interesting. Uh, okay. I'll try to present the questions, but I see now we have more than 46 questions. Oh. Try to do best. Uh, next one is from Farooq Tamimi. Uh, he said, uh, Professor Ortega, I wonder if motivation strategies will also help make up for weakness in aptitude aspects, like weaknesses in analysis or memory. Yeah, yeah. I get that question a lot. Actually, I get the question, what's more important, aptitude or motivation? If we, if we pit one against the other, which one is going to win? Um, and uh, my answer would be, actually, when aptitude is low, when we have students who are, they seem to just be weak at learning languages, they just don't have a whole lot of natural ability. That's when motivation is super, super important. Because someone with the best ability in the world, if they're not motivated, they won't put effort and then they won't learn English. But if someone has a love for English or a real goal to learn English for something that they want to achieve in their own life, then even if they don't have a whole lot of aptitude, they will just put more time, more effort and persist until they get their goals. So I think that if we compare aptitude and motivation, definitely motivation is more important because it can really make up for low aptitude. Interesting. The next question is, uh, okay, is also from uh, Rizwan Uddin. He said, uh, how to deal with language class anxiety and language use anxiety among students? How to deal with... Language with... class anxiety and language use anxiety among the students. 
anticity. I don't, questions. I don't understand the word anch- anticity. Anxiety, uh, anxious. Oh, anxious. Ah, anxious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being anxious. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. So people with low aptitude are likely to be anxious because they know, they sense that they're not as good as the people around them. This is very important. When someone has difficulty remembering words, pronouncing well, um, understanding grammar or figuring out the grammar uh, patterns in a language, they know. And they look around and other peers, other students seem to be a lot faster picking those things up, right? So that creates anxiety in them. And Lack of motivation normally is related to no anxiety because people don't invest in learning English and therefore they don't feel super anxious whether they're learning it or not. But uh, in general, anxiety has been studied a lot and we do believe that there is something that is specific to foreign language anxiety. So how do we address that? We need to create assignments, ways of giving feedback that are very, very reassuring and that try to make students uh, more relaxed and more confident. Um, I think that probably some of the motivational strategies in the list of 10 motivational strategies that I showed are the best ways of trying to lower the anxiety of students, showing that we care, showing that we appreciate their effort um, connecting what we teach, the, the themes, the contents, the, the topics of the readings and the listenings to things that they actually experience in their own lives. And that those types of strategies for motivation are also likely to lower the anxiety of the students. The next question from our colleague Abdul Khaliq Al Qahtani. He said, Would you agree that integrative motivation? Is intrinsic in a sense? Is intrinsic in a sense. Yes, yes, I would agree. But I think they are distinct as well. Um, If you remember the examples of the two students that I showed, one said, I really, really want to be able to master the language to, to, to speak like a native speaker and with native speakers. That's the integrative motivation. You want to to blend in and to be surrounded by others who speak English and to feel like you're one of them. The intrinsic motivation is more a a source of pleasure in learning English, in using English, in listening to English, and you don't necessarily have a good reason for it. Um, So the student who said... I don't like it when while I'm writing, but once I'm done and I've written a whole paragraph, I love it, right? Um, so if we see that our students have an intrinsic motivation, for example, towards reading or listening uh, to English, we can exploit that. So if they like, some people say, I love the pronunciation of English in this accent or that accent. Or some people say, um, I like it when I go on the internet and I do find, I don't know, reviews about restaurants in English, right? So those would be intrinsic ways of just enjoying English. And so they don't necessarily involve uh, feeling like you want to be surrounded by speakers of English from the countries that you know speak English. The next question is from uh, Amar Mitwali. She asked, with reference to your publication about technology, would you, would you please shed light on the impact of technology on aptitude? Or in another way, is there any correlation or effect of technology on aptitude? Thank you for that question. That's a very interesting question. I don't think it's been investigated, and it would be worth investigating. So... Um, Obviously, there is quite a bit of research showing that technology motivates students. So the relationship between technology and motivation has been researched quite a bit. There is also research showing, amazingly, that when students do 
uh, engage in technology for leisure, for pleasure. So outside the classroom, no one is telling them to do something with online uh, types of things, but they go and they do it. So gaming or social media and on their own, they go and they use English, um, but all they're interested in is using Facebook or doing gaming, but they encounter a lot of English while doing it. The research shows that actually students in those contexts learn a lot of extra vocabulary and chunks and even some grammar. So we know that technology also promotes a lot of implicit learning. But there is no research that has tried to look at whether more aptitude or less aptitude in the area of memory for words or the area of memory for sounds or the area of um, implicit, uh, explicit analytical ability or implicit statistical learning in any of those areas. That high aptitude in any of those areas results in better use of technology and more learning of language through technology. So it's a good research area, but it hasn't been explored yet. Interesting. Well, the next question, uh, in a similar way, but it's from Rania al uh, uh She asks, do you think age affects aptitude? I studied Hebrew for two semesters and I found it not as learning English at all. So she asked him, is there any correlation also between age and aptitude? Very good question. I can tell a lot of the, the webinar attendees are very expert uh, researchers and, and very avid readers of research. So there is a few studies, a few studies only, looking at the relationship between aptitude and age. And the findings are very mixed and very contradictory. Some, uh, of, some of the studies show that for young children, differences in aptitude don't matter. So if someone starts learning English at age three, four, five, six, seven, ten, it won't matter if they have higher or low aptitude. They'll just be very good at English by the end of the learning process. Whereas if you are an adult, if you start learning English at age, I don't know, 15, 20, 30, or being immersed in real English use at that time, right? So perhaps not studying English, but beyond the classroom, being able to use English in the real world. If you start doing that at age 15, 20, 30, 40, then aptitude differences explain why some of those adults get much further with English than others. But that's a few of the studies. Other studies have found that differences in aptitude matter for all ages. So even very young uh, children starting to learn a new language at age four, five, six, if they have better aptitude, they're going to achieve more at the end of the learning process than other people at their same age with lower aptitude. So the findings are quite contradictory and we don't really know the answer to the, what's the relationship between aptitude and age. One problem is that oftentimes the studies don't have enough variability in aptitude. So, in terms of statistics, we cannot really establish the relationship between two variables unless we have a lot of variability in both variables. So with age, we have to sample people at many different ages for the beginning of the learning in a meaningful context. But for aptitude too, we would have to sample the participants at very different types, uh, different um, levels of aptitude, because otherwise, the relationship may be there, but it's just not possible to see it in, uh, in the statistics, right? So, so far, completely pending and unresolved as a question. Interesting. The next question is uh, from our colleague, Faqih Rabai. I want to quote it in um, during the presentation. He asks, is there a way to identify cause and effect relationship between language motivation and language anxiety? In other words, what cause, what causes which? Is is it high anxious students like that causes low uh, motivation, or it's vice versa? Uh -huh. uh, hmm. Well, 
I don't know of any studies that have looked at the relationship of the two directly. Mm. So in the same study, measuring both and then trying to understand how they work. So I think what I would say is that we know that some language anxiety is uh, detrimental, is negative, and it impedes learning. But a certain level of anxiety can be facilitative, it can be positive, it can support some learning. So if you don't care about anything at all, you're not anxious. And then uh, if you don't care about English, you're not anxious about doing well or not in your English class, in your English tests, or when you're trying to use English out in the world, right? So then you're not anxious, but also you're not trying. So a little bit of anxiety when you are nervous because you want to do well, because you want to succeed, because you want to try, is positive. So it is possible that if we had studies looking at motivation and anxiety in the same studies, we may have to differentiate between people with high motivation and some positive levels of anxiety versus people with negative levels of anxiety and I agree that probably they would be low in their motivation. Mm, interesting. Okay, the next question from, uh, I think, I believe he's Dr. Muhammad Mahsin from Najran University. And he asks, how do you operationalize the motivation construct? In other words, how do we reach a conclusion that right. our students are motivated, less motivated, or highly motivated? Right. So uh, the way the research does it is through questionnaires. We have many different questionnaires that are used by researchers and they have been developed, they have been tried many times, they have been statistically uh, improved so that they are reliable. But with questionnaires, of course, we only get answers to things that we ask. So if you decide for example, that integrative and instrumental motivation is probably very important in your context and you don't need to worry about any other kinds of motivation, then you would give your students the questionnaire that the researchers who propose the integrative instrumental motivation model use. And you can find them actually, if you Google, you probably can find them. So you would give them that questionnaire and you would ask and you would try to, to find out which students um, are high on instrumental motivation, which students are high on uh, instrumental and integrative motivation. But then you wouldn't be asking them about their ideal self, right? Because the, the questionnaire is to ask them about integrative and instrumental motivation only. So for the ideal self, we also have very good questionnaires that have been developed and used many, many times. And so they have questions about, can you imagine yourself being the kind of speaker of English in the future that you want to be? Uh, uh, what what uh, other components of the ideal self are things like, how much do you like your tick your teachers, your textbook, your program, how satisfied are you with the quality of instruction, etc. So we, we know how to measure the ideal self. But again, we would only be asking about the ideal self and not about other kinds of motivation. So that is, to some extent, a limitation, if you want, how to apply the questionnaires in the real world of a classroom well, the teacher has to choose one model of motivation that they think is better for their own context, and then they would be able to measure that motivation through that questionnaire with their students. Interesting. The next question is from Abdullah al Kahpani. I think you uh, answered this one. Do you think the technology will increase motivation of learning the target language? And I think you said yes, there is correlation between them. So the answer. The next question will be from Hassan El Faifi. How do teachers discover what type of their students' aptitude? Is it sufficient to observe them one day or they need to do a test? I would not recommend teachers to do a test of aptitude for their students. Uh, there are a few, a few problems with that. If you, if you use the MLAT, MLATA, the Moral Language um, uh, aptitude test, 
that one is expensive and so you know you don't want to use it the llama is free online it's not too long but what are you going to do if you have a score for each student and you have to tell them you scored really low or you scored really high it's quite difficult to do that the high lab takes hours and it, it's excruciatingly long and difficult so i think it only works for for research contexts um I would not try to infer the aptitude of students by observing them. I think that that's not reliable. But I think the middle ground is to ask them to tell you in writing, the way I did it in my study, to tell you in writing about their strengths and weaknesses. So what do you think you're good at with English? And what do you think you're not so good at with English? What kinds of strategies do you use to help yourself learn English better? And when you, let, when you let them just write about that, oftentimes you can read what they say and then you can, you can realize, oh, they're feeling quite weak with their ability to learn new words. They're constantly complaining that they're forgetting the words, that there's too many words, there's too long lists, that they cannot do it, right? Or you feel like, oh, they are, you know, fine with the word learning, but they are telling me that they're always confused about the grammar and that they cannot follow the explanations and that they don't understand why you use this here and that there. So then their analytical ability. The only uh, type of aptitude that cannot be observed is the ability to just pick up patterns of language without even trying hard to do so. Right? That we would never be able to observe or to ask students to tell us in writing. That we could only observe with a test, uh, the high lab test, actually. But again, I don't recommend that we do that. I think it's important to be intuitive about it. It's just kind of like sensing if we have very special cases of high aptitude or low aptitude in some area that we want to address through our teaching. Interesting. I'll try to do my best to present that, but uh, I could not, uh, there are more than now 63 questions. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, Mr. Abdurrahman, I, I, maybe I'll, your question at the bottom of that list, so I could not present it, but I'll say the, the question first comes, first to be presented. The next question from Hassan Shehri, uh, he said, are there specific strategies to keep young learners of SLA motivated? Uh -huh. It's interesting. The studies of motivation with young learners are very difficult to do because when you ask them in a questionnaire about learning English, if they like it, why they like it, how they like it, young children just want to please their teachers or, or their researchers. So they always just say, yes, it's, yes, I like everything, I like everything. <laughs> so it's very difficult to understand what actually motivates very young children. Uh, but one thing that definitely will enhance their motivation is using age-appropriate instructional materials and approaches. So explaining grammar to a very young child is not going to be motivated. But teaching them songs, having them play cards and use chunks of language in English that go with different actions during the playing of the cards... Um, trying to watch, I don't know, Sesame Street in English, whatever it is that kids at that age would do in English, that's going to be motivating. But if we try to apply the topics, the formats, the approaches to teaching that we do with older children to young children, that's likely to not keep their interest and their attention and their motivation. Maybe... Uh, um the question before the last one from Rania Zahrani. She says, what do you, what to do with students who are not willing to learn a language at all? Do you feel like they are forced to learn the language while they are not interested? Uh -huh. so what we should do with students who are not willing to learn language, but they are in language classroom. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a huge problem with teaching English in every context that I know of in the world, right? Uh, there can be very low levels of motivation because they are just forced to be in EFL classes 
and they are told by society and by parents that they need to do really well in English in order to get a degree, get a job and be successful in society. But that's not sufficient to, to get people to be motivated. However, I find it important to realize that we can go to our students and say, okay, I know, I know there is very little reason that you can find to study English right now in, in our context, the way things are. But are there things that would make the learning of English more fun for you? And it may be that someone loves a sport. So they're fun of a sport that they watch in Saudi Arabia. I don't know what kinds of sports you have. But they love a sport or they love reading poetry or they love cooking or they love going to the movies. They love something else, right? And if the teacher finds out that, they can try to make a connection between that and doing it in English or learning about that, but in English. So one thing that I did with my students in the Spanish class, these were university students, I was asking them to write three academic papers in one semester. And this was the first time they had, the academic papers were like five pages long. They weren't that big, but they had references. They had to cite sources. It was a big deal to write that in Spanish. They had never done anything like that before. And so one thing that I did is leave the topics open for them to choose. So I didn't say, you have to, to write a five-page academic paper about some aspect of the Spanish culture for example, because some people are going to love Spanish culture and be motivated by it. And other people are just going to hate it or they're going to be completely indifferent. So I said, you choose your topics. It's three papers this semester. You have to do all three. Every time you tell me what topic you want to do and I will help you find some resources in Spanish and you can do the topic. So it was incredibly interesting to see the topics that different students chose. Some students stuck to culture because obviously they were interested in that. Other students um, wrote about sports, for example, and the topics were so different uh, from student to student and sometimes from paper to paper by the same student. Like they would tell me, well, I just wrote about, you know, this filmmaker in Spain and now I'm bored and I want to do something about my family or this disease in society or this problem in, in the field that I'm studying. So I think that giving choices to students to choose things that interest them through English may make them a little bit more positive about English, not necessarily change completely their levels of motivation, but make a little bit of improvement in their levels of motivation. Yeah, I think this is the last question. I'm so sorry that we have 65 questions, but I could not present them. We don't have running out of time. So the last question from Salim Muhammad Nazim. He said, is there any correlation between aptitude and motivation? Um, correlation between aptitude and motivation? motivation. You know, normally researchers who are interested in aptitude do think do not think that motivation is important and the other way around researchers who study motivation don't think that aptitude is important and there's a very real human reason for that researchers of aptitude are very interested in how the mind works and how cognition works and they think that some people are born with certain abilities and other people are born with other abilities. So they want to investigate that. And they connect it to age or they connect it to other issues like can we teach grammar explicitly or implicitly depending on the type of aptitude that people have. But they think motivation is just like a very emotional, affective kind of thing and it doesn't matter. You know, motivation doesn't matter that much. And the researchers who study motivation, they think that aptitude is like, we can't change it. It's, if it's genetic, as some people think, then what are we going to do about it? We cannot change it. So I'm interested in studying motivation because that's what we can change, what we can improve, what we can understand better. 
And so we don't have, I think there may be one or two studies, but we don't have really a line of research that looks at aptitude and motivation so that they are correlated and compared. Of course, when we are good at something, we usually like doing that thing better. Yeah? And it's a mutually reinforcing relationship. So if I'm good at tennis, I will play more tennis and like tennis. If I'm bad at tennis, I will stop playing and doing it. Right? So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg uh, problem. But the empirical evidence is not there because the two communities of researchers are not super interested in the other, in the other communities' construct. For teachers, I think I hope to have shown clearly that you must attend to motivation very, very much and not take it for granted. Even if you think you're doing well with motivating your students, you can do better if you look deeper into the different kinds of motivations that they may have. And you should not give up on attitude, aptitude entirely because there are things we can do to sort of like help out when different types of strengths and weaknesses are apparent in our classroom. Interesting, interesting. So that was the last question. I'm so sorry for the rest because we have many questions. Now 64 and 34. Muhammad, again, he asked questions. Sayyid Rayhan, DA, Richa, Abu Nawaf, Hawawil, Abdurrahman, Muhammad, Hadil, Sayyid, Shishagal, Anonymous, Attendees, Muhammad, Ghanim, Iman, Baklav, Hala Saleh, Abdullah Mahdi, Sobia, Qurashi, Shahraya, Abdul Kadir, Abu Nawaf, Richa, Murshid, Haider, Shodri, and Hind, Muhammad, Shahrani, Yahya al Faifi, and the rest is long, Dr. Abdul Khaliq. Was as I'm so sorry for, for them, I could not present your questions because we are running our time and it's now 12 past 10. So I have to look uh, in the, this webinar on behalf of my colleagues at the Faculty of Languages and Translation. I thank you so much, Professor Ortega, for this interesting and informative presentation. We learn a lot, and uh, well, my colleagues asked me to thank you so much. So I thank you. Thank you also goes to the Deanship of E-Learning, the Dean Dr. Fahad Al-Ahmeri and Riyadh Saab who with us and helping us to organize this one. And uh, also for the attendees, uh, at some points we have more than 65, 165 attendees. Thank you so much. And also for my colleagues in the kingdom from different universities. I saw colleagues from uh, King Saudi University, from Najran University, and uh, thank you so much for attending this. And uh, we, inshallah, will upload, uh, we recorded the presentation and we will upload it on YouTube. And uh, I will send you the link, uh, inshallah. And uh, inshallah, we are now uh, starting to organize the next webinar and I will, inshallah, uh, tell you about it later on. Thank you Great. so much. For, thank you so much for attending. And I think this is the conclusion of this interesting webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Al Hamami. And thank you to all the participants. And thank you for your questions. It's very encouraging to have so many questions. Sorry we couldn't cover all of them, but I'm very happy to see so much interest and so many questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So I think we, now you can leave uh, the, the room. Okay. I am going to stop sharing and I will leave the meeting. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Riyadh, we have to cover the testing. We have to cover the testing. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Muhammad Shahrani, Khulud, Richard, P.S., Sabina. Thank you so much. And you can leave the...